In this episode, we mark the 20th anniversary of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by exploring the female characters in the Harry Potter series. We recorded this live with an audience at the Cinemagic Festival in Belfast on Halloween 2021. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? This is episode 96 of Girls on Film, which feels so exciting. And you know what? We're also celebrating a birthday today because we've been going for three years. Very happy. Yes, happy birthday to us. Thank you for being here to celebrate with us. And it's always so lovely to be at Cinemagic. It's a beautiful city, beautiful festival. Um, Now, we'd love you to chip in with questions and comments as we go along. Um, It's really nice to have everyone here. So feel free, because I know a lot of us share a passion for similar things. So it'd be really nice to, to have the opportunity to chat. It's 20 years since Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone came out amazingly. So we thought we'd go for a spooky, magical theme today. Before I get more into Harry Potter, let's have a clip. There's this wonderful compilation of the women in Harry Potter. Your attention, please. It's quite easy, dear. Don't be afraid. Something you'd like to say, dear? Oh, there are several things I would like to say. Put me down. Don't call me Nymphadora. Harry Potter, you listen to me right now. Shut it! That was bloody brilliant. Oh, thank you for that assessment, Mr. Weasley. Come on, then! Leave him alone. Here, Totem Locomotor! Locomotor! You can realize, of course, can't keep up you know who indefinitely. That doesn't mean we can't delay him. And his name is Voldemort. Lovely stuff. What wonderful women. Now, later on, we're going to have a video interview with one of the Harry Potter cast, as well as reviews of other magical films and some new releases. But first of all, we're talking about Harry Potter, so I thought, who do I know who's a great film critic who loves Harry Potter? Well, what do you know? BBC Radio Six Music Film and TV critic is a self-professed Harry Potter nerd. She is Rihanna Dillon. Please welcome her to the stage, Rihanna. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Girls on Film and welcome to the stage at Cinemagic. And uh, how are you feeling? Are you happy to be here? I am so excited. Honestly, this is such a great pleasure for me. It is one of my favourite subjects to talk about generally. So the fact that I get to do it professionally is huge. (laughs) Now, your fandom is pretty hardcore. Right, because when I asked you a little bit more about this, you shared that you have indeed, this is topical for Halloween, dressed up as yes. a Harry Potter character. Now, people might have an idea about who Rihanna might have dressed up as. Any, any thoughts on who she might have dressed up as? Kind of going with the witchy vibe today, <laughs> black stars. Who do you think? Bellatrix. Bellatrix. I've got the hair. It could yeah. definitely go wilder. That's a good shout. I would have said possibly Bellatrix, but in fact, should we have a picture? <laughs> This is Rihanna as Dumbledore. (laughs) (laughs) The best character. (laughs) I love that. This is a nice, surprising choice. Tell me more about this picture, what we're looking at. We will put this on social media for the listeners at home. That's my my poor friend who's who's actually supposed to be Harry Potter and is blindfolded there because it was her Hindu and she had no idea we were throwing her a um, Harry Potter-themed Hindu. So she wasn't allowed to know, even as we wrapped scarves around her and shoved the Marauder's map in her hands, um, that she was... (laughs) Harry Potter until we played Hedwig's theme as she came down the stairs into the Great Hall. So it was great. It was so fun. And the theme continues in your own life because congratulations, Rihanna, you recently got engaged. Thanks, yes. (laughs) Tell me about the wedding. (laughs) I really wish I hadn't told you this now. Um, (laughs) We are hoping to decorate a part of our venue to look like Hogwarts because (laughs) we're, we're getting married in a place that looks a little bit like a castle. And if there are turrets involved, then... Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't I want to make it look like 
in Harry Potter's world. You are you are definitely past the test of being committed to yeah. Harry Potter and being earning your place on the, the stage right here. Guest, yeah. Let's test the audience. Um, who here is a big fan? Do people? I think we already have someone dressed up. I think we've got a Hufflepuff, have we there? In robes as well, no less. Aww. Thank you for committing. That, that is wonderful. <laughs> I'm curious um, who here has kind of done a marathon of watching all the films in one weekend. Has anyone done that yet? The oh, hand yes. there. Oh, few, few people. Excellent. Amazing. Yeah, because I mean, I went to see them all when they screened to press because I've been doing this for a long time. So that's when I start. start. When did you start seeing them? Really? Um, well, I'm the same age as the actors, roughly, yeah. of, of the main three. So I kind of watched them growing up with them. So, yeah, so 20 years ago, yeah. I was at the cinema watching it. Amazing. Well, listen, let's start with the big one. If we're going to talk about the women in Harry Potter, who are we going to start with? Holy cricket, you're Harry Potter. I'm Hermione Granger. And you are? Um, Ron Weasley. Pleasure. You two better change into robes. I expect we'll be arriving soon. You've got dirt on your nose, by the way. Did you know? Just there. Let's talk about her as a goodie. We'll start with the good girls, because she's a bit of a goodie too, shoes in some ways, isn't she, she Hermione? Is. She Tell is. me more about what you think about Hermione and what she brings to the series as a complex, I hope, female character. Well, I think what's so lovely about Hermione is that she's really kind of got her dues sort of the, the further on the fandom has grown and the, you know, the more time that we've spent looking back on the films. Because I think perhaps knee-jerk looking at the movies, you might think that Emma Watson isn't necessarily per a perfect actress in these films. But the what is so wonderful about her connection with Hermione is actually how like she is in real life. You know, she is so swatty. There are all those wonderful stories about, um, was it Chris Columbus maybe in the first film who set all three of them um, a task to write an essay about their characters. And um, I think Emma Watson turned in like pages <laughs> about Hermione um, and Dan Radcliffe turned in one page about Harry and... Rupert Grint didn't even do it because <laughs> Ron wouldn't have probably. So yeah, so I think that's really lovely. Um, and also there, people keep saying Harry Potter would have died in the first film, in the first book without Hermione. And it is so true. Think about the devil's snare. Think about all of those. Think about the potions. There is absolutely no way that Harry would have got through that without Hermione. So she's an incredibly special character. The fact that she's been so loyal to him throughout. There is no point where she really falls out with Harry in the same way that Ron does, for example. She stays as close and as loyal and true to him as possible. There are moments which have always slightly frustrated me, like when they don't believe him about Draco Malfoy being a Death Eater. And I, I that, that's, uh, you know, that's maybe my own issue <laughs> with the plot line of this. I don't really believe that Hermione would have doubted him quite so much. That's interesting. So why do you think it was in there for dramatic purposes? Yeah, yeah. I think for, to, yeah. for Harry to feel even more isolated yeah. um, and alone and frustrated and sort of to create that... You know, in, in the same way that Luna points out, she sort of says how Voldemort likes to make sure that his enemies are completely friendless, which is mm. sort of what happens there, I think. Um, but otherwise, I think she is an incredible character. She stays so strong under torture from Bellatrix as well in the later films. And she just, she never really gives up. She's always thinking. She's always looking in books to find a solution for the next thing and she often finds it. I'm also interested in the way that she pulls Harry and Ron up on things sometimes, yes. you know, if they're, if they're they're generally what we would call allies, nice boys, but sometimes they underestimate women, sometimes they make, you know, assumptions about them when they're looking for dates for the dance or whatever. <laughs> um, and then she kind of, she checks them on their unconscious bias, whether they think that the, the book must have been written by a man mm -hmm. or that, you know, they, they make some reference to girls being trolls or something. Yeah. Does, does that appeal to you, the way yeah. she does that? I love that. And although the trouble is, there is that element of her coming across as a little bit naggy sometimes and I, I kind of get a bit frustrated with the with their reactions to her because like you mm. say she's a know-it-all Snape calls her that Ron calls her that um the other girls are also obviously quite jealous of her intelligence um mm. so she's she often seems quite a lonely character and I'm quite glad in the films they make it 
so that she does become a bit more part of a female group, especially with Dumbledore's army. I think there's some really lovely scenes with her. That is important, I think, yeah, to see the women interacting. I mean, on Girls on Film, we're often talking about the Bechdel test, which yes. is a test to see if other women are actually talking to each other about yeah. something that isn't a man. And this d goes on to do that a little bit more, I think, as the series yes. progresses, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and of course, Emma Watson has done fantastic work for feminism. I mean, years before Time's Up and Me Too, she was flying the flag in a way of a, a new wave of feminism for mm. young women, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think she is a great role model and really does really does try her best to, to use her platform for, for good, for better, which is always really inspiring. Um, and I think it's something that is, is very inspired by Hermione, who uses yeah. her platform as a human to root for other wizarding other creatures in the wizarding world obviously with spew <laughs> s-p-e-w not spew obviously <laughs> well i mean she's not the only harry potter star actually to have used her platform to talk about important issues i think and you know jesse cave who played lavender brown has done that and also ivana lynch um, the irish actress who plays luna lovegood How do you know where I was? We're experts. Your head's full of them. Sorry I made you miss the carriages, by the way, Luna. That's all right. It's like being with a friend. Well, I am your friend, Luna. That's nice. She's a very fun character, isn't she? She's fantastic. I think what's really interesting, though, about that scene is that... Obviously, in the books, that those all that all those lines are given to Tonks's character, and they're given <laughs> to um, Luna in this. And so, I, so I was I was doing um, I was doing a Q and A recently with the writers of the new Bond film, and they were talking about with with female characters, especially. Um, I think they were talking. They didn't specify, but I'm sure that's what they meant. Mm -hmm. Was that when they give to one character, they have to take away from another. And I think that's really interesting in the kind of context of the Harry Potter world because we do see that happening a lot. Certain lines that should normally be attributed to Ginny, for example, um, get given to Hermione. Um, and in the case of Luna, she gets a much bigger role, but that's because we don't see enough of Tonks, which I think is a real shame that it has to be spread so thin among the female characters. However, I think Ivana Lynch does such a great job as Luna. It is brilliant to see her even more on our screens. And she has this real gorgeous ethereal nature to her when she's giving advice. It's not, sometimes Hermione, for example, could come across as quite patronizing. Um, whereas it just seems she's so sort of grounded in nature and her own world. She does not care what other people think about her, which is such a lovely thing to see on screen with a female or the young female character who doesn't care if people laugh at her her other women especially other girls especially do laugh at her um including Hermione and um Lavender and so just to see her ignore all of that and to keep going is why I think she forms such a beautiful bond with Harry for me she's sort of the Phoebe in friends yeah. of the group you know like you say that quirky one that really doesn't care yeah and that, as you say that is a wonderful example and also the fact that she just has a pure platonic friendship with Harry, you know, yeah. and that's really important to see as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about Ginny Weasley, okay. shall we? Okay. I mean, she's a bit of a fighter, isn't she? What do you think of her? Yeah, and also we see this from Ginny from so early on in the Chamber of Secrets when she stands up to Draco, which is, you know, would be quite terrifying for a young girl who can't even speak to her crush, but actually is willing to really put herself out there against this really horrible boy and knowing that she is going to come under fire for it and doesn't care so we see from the age of 12 how brave she can be um, and that only just kind of gets re-emphasized even more as the films go on we see her grow to be even funnier to be quite you know devil may care and it's that influence of the twins I think especially yeah. that they have over her um, she's an incredible Quidditch player and we know that she goes on to become a professional Quidditch player which is really really cool um I really really love the character of Ginny again I think the films perhaps do her a little bit of a disservice and I think a lot of people were quite frustrated with the relationship with Harry mm. and the kind of I don't know maybe they didn't necessarily believe in the chemistry as much because we weren't really given that development in the same way that we are 
in the books. Mm -hmm. um, but I think given everything, <laughs> you know, given the, the fact that they have to take from other characters, etc., I think they, that Ginny still comes across as an incredibly powerful young witch. I think so. And Molly Weasley, of course. <gasps> I favorite. mean, Molly, <laughs> what a force to be reckoned with. Oh, and there's so gorgeous. much going on with her throughout the whole series, isn't there? What do you admire about her? Yeah, so Molly, she's she's very maternal, isn't she? She kind of really plays into that quite domestic role of the mother. We see her cooking all the time. So much of her personality almost is cooking and cleaning and preparing food and also protecting her children. And also Harry, she becomes Harry's mother in the absence mm -hmm. of his own mm -hmm. um so that's that relationship is so beautiful and you, that again that bond that connection that they have and it and i think that's something that ron feels quite keenly because he perhaps doesn't realize just that all this love that she has can be shared she's so used to sharing all of her love with all of her children um but the fact that harry she does see harry's a son i think ron does get a little bit jealous of that mm -hmm. um but there is a lot of molly to go around so it's okay um she's a i think she's she goes on a real journey herself the, obviously there are those really powerful scenes where um she yeah well i we're going to see you know what may be the most powerful of molly's moments and the bit that always makes me cry without fail the big battle not my daughters you bitch <laughs> 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 She, she's so kind of mumsy all the way through. And then she has this moment where she's, Fred has died. She's in an incredibly dark place. She doesn't want anybody to touch her children again. And so she steps up and makes sure that they won't. And it's it always gives me goosebumps. And the fact that we don't, you know, they don't really swear very often in Harry Potter either. So when they do, it, it feels kind of really impactful, especially when Molly does it, who you know would be so anti her children doing it. It feels like a real full stop. You know, this is it. This is the end of Bellatrix. And it's a fantastic moment. It's a fantastic turning point as well, where we start to believe, oh, this is a battle they could actually win. And I wanted to briefly ask you about Bellatrix. Though. Yes, what, what do you yeah. Think of Bellatrix? Well, Bellatrix, I just think is, you know, she is a kind of religious fanatic. You know, she is so devoted to Voldemort. She is literally insane. I think if she wasn't before she went into Azkaban, <laughs> she definitely was when she came out. She looks terrifying again I think Helena Bonham Carter plays her so well that was such a brilliant um page to screen you know move everyone's favorite goth uh, yeah I mean she's the best really was um and the fact that she is very she's again like Umbridge completely amoral really remorseless and oh but also she she gets to I think they have a, lot, a bit of fun with Bellatrix when she is played by Hermione. And that's one of my favourite bits, I think, just seeing Helena Bonham Carter having a lot of fun with that. Um, and the fact that seeing someone as evil and creepy as Bellatrix having to, to be like a teenage scared girl was fabulous. I wish to enter my vault. Identification? I hardly think that would be necessary. Madame Lestrange. I don't like to be kept waiting. I know. I know she's an imposter. I've been warned. Would you mind presenting your wand? And why should I do that? It's the bank's policy. I'm sure you understand, given the current climate. No, I most certainly do not understand. I'm afraid. I must insist. Very well, Madame Lestrange. 
if you will follow me. And of course, this talking about Bellatrix brings us into the not so good characters. Um, there are some nasty but fun characters and you've picked out a few. Aunt Marge is one of them. I love Aunt Marge. <laughs> I think Pam Ferris plays her so well. And it is just such a fun scene to see her blowing up, literally, to blow up your art. I mean, how many people have wanted to do that to a member of their family? And Harry <laughs> actually gets to and doesn't get in any trouble. I mean, look at that bosom. <laughs> well. She is such a fantastically evil character really the fact that she just is really happy to play into the Dursley's abuse of Harry and um, do you remember when um, Harry is kind of going through his memories with Snape with the, in the kind of occlumency bits and Snape points out that there's a bit where Harry is being terrorised by a dog and so the fact that Aunt Marge's dog Ripper is has kind of really stayed in Harry's really hard, miserable, sad memories, I think is really telling of actually how how big a moment this is, how much he's how long he's wanted to get revenge on Aunt Marge for. So I think it's a, just a brilliant open. I think it's one of my favourites in the Harry Potter world. And your next choice is someone who I think proves the adage that baddies do get the best wardrobes, and that is Rita Skeeter. <laughs> of it's, course, you know, poisonous tabloid journalist in a way, but she's so much fun, right? It's a really <laughs> recognisable character as well. You know, this is someone who's so out for herself and she does not care who she hurts to get what she wants. Actually, she's a little bit like the Scream character Gail Weathers in Scream. I think they're a really good oh, kind yeah, of... yeah, that's a good yeah, kind comparison. Of, yeah. yeah, double... Um, they do well as a double bill together. I think they'd be friends because they both know how to get what they want out of their out of people, out of contributors, even if it means lying a little bit or quite a lot. Um, but also Rita's really interesting. The fact that she became an animagus just to try and dig up dirt. She is so committed to her job. That's actually something to kind of admire about Rita Skeeter. Well, she's a career woman, right? She, so this is a good example is. in some ways. But yeah. it's interesting what you say about a career woman because it kind of feels like women don't really have careers in the same way in at least the the books, the Harry Potter books. They obviously, Hermione, we know later on, goes on to do wonderful things. Um, but, you know, looking at Molly Weasley, for example, she doesn't have a job. She's, again, the kind of stay-at-home mother, housewife. Um, and Tonks, she's an aura. It works with the ministry, but possibly one of the very few mm. with Umbridge that we mm. that we see have have a job, apart from gone, apart from the teachers. That you know we don't. Whereas all, like, quite a lot of them, met, I suppose, because there are so many Weasleys, so many older Weasleys who all go off and all have jobs. So I think maybe there is an element of imbalance there. You mentioned Umbridge. I love this character. She's so fantastic in that it's so much fun to hate her. Is it just, is she more frightening than Voldemort? Does she scare you more than Voldemort? Can I have a show of hands? <laughs> oh, that's quite a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. She is, I think, again, because seeing a, a really brilliant female villain is awesome. And we don't, I don't know, we don't need to kind of have this whole, we don't have a whole backstory to her in the same way that we do with Voldemort. And she's also not the kind of sexualized kind of, you know, shoulder pad wearing, black clad, you know, yeah. sexy villainess. Yeah. She's like a pink twin set wearing little old lady who loves cats. Yes. And that's rather fun and has a bit of a twist on it. And also anything to do with cats, I'm a fan of. <laughs> I want those plates very much, creepy as they might be. Yeah, the fact that she's kind of described as toad-like a lot, I really enjoy because obviously to toads are, no offence, repulsive to toads um but yeah you're right she doesn't conform to those sort of evil tropes in the same way that Bellatrix does for example just comparing the looks of these two brilliantly evil characters Umbridge and Bellatrix Bellatrix is exactly what we imagine I think of kind of evil embodied in yeah. a female body it really the stereotypical like you know the fairy tales yes. you know the wicked witch yeah and I think actually we need a bit of that I think we like we kind of we want to see a proper genuine terrifying witch and I, I like that there are evil witches in the world as well as good you know it brings us that much needed balance yeah I think to have both in the same series is, yes. is brilliant you're going to be doing some lines for me today Mr Potter no not with your quill I'm going to be using a rather special one of mine Now, I want you to write, I must not tell lies. 
How many times? Well, let's say for as long as it takes for the message to sink in. You haven't given me any ink. Oh, you won't need any ink. Nothing. That's right. Because you know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. Don't you, Mr. Potter? Now, you touched on it earlier, saying that there are a couple of things you were less comfortable with in the series in terms of from a gender perspective. Do you think there's, for you, anything controversial from a gender or indeed race perspective in the Harry Potter films as well as books i mean yeah i was one of the kind of um one of the indian girls who was really excited about seeing parvati and padma on screen wearing beautiful saris and they do not get beautiful saris that they could have had considering all the kind of fabrics in the world that they could have used to make something really magical um so that was a real disappointment and i show i think that really showed a lack of interest and diversity behind the screen as well as in front of we barely see any people of color doing anything <laughs> apart from maybe Kingsley um, who we know becomes Minister for Magic but uh, yeah I, I think that I, I'd like to say I, that's is that changing but I don't know if it even particularly is in the world of Fantastic Beasts etc you know all the kind mm. of spin-offs um, but yes it's an incredibly white cast um, and also, this, I mean, I'm, I'm going way off now, but when we were looking at a character like Dean Thomas, for example, I think about this now because I listen to Stephen Fry's audiobooks a lot. And um, A, he plays Dean Thomas, I think, as maybe the only working class character in the whole of the series. And also the fact that Dean Thomas is um, black, is single parent family, um, father has deserted them. It just feels like it's really playing into a stereotype type there that it really didn't need to um which again you don't necessarily pick up on when you're 11 12 and you, as you get older you think actually that's incredibly problematic and we'll just touch very briefly on this but obviously there's been controversy around jk rowling's views about transgender people for you are you able to separate that from the stories and from the way that you look at the films in particular and the way that they tackle gender I, I think as such a huge fan of Harry Potter, I have to separate it. I think you have a choice. And I think we, well, I have this conversation a lot with lots of um, directors, for example, who have either since or during or before making films and then done something really, really horrendous, which I won't go into now because we have a young audience here. But um, you have to make a choice, I think, whether you want to carry on supporting something or if you can stop supporting the future but you can continue loving what you held on to when you were younger or what the kind of work that you really loved um and so I think you know that is a choice and I don't think you can you can someone can lambast you for that because it's not I don't think it is necessarily always about the artist but about the art which I know is a bit of a cop-out and I think it is very dependent on the kind of things that this person is doing yes with jk rowling yeah i, I if it's i'm really glad that so many people who have worked with her have come out against her to sort mm -hmm. of say that this is not okay we do not support these views um but i think that from my perspective you can still be a fan of harry potter and not support those views couldn't agree more well answered um now next up um we're going to have a video shortly but first we're going to have a clip of this character in action Thanks for God's sake. <laughs> Professor Moody. 
What are you doing? Rescuing you, of course. But where are we going? The letter said that I've been expelled from Hogwarts. But you haven't been. Not yet. Kingsley, you take point. Uh, but the letter said... Dumbledore has persuaded the minister to suspend your expulsion pending a formal hearing. A hearing? Uh-huh. Don't worry, Harry. We'll explain everything when we get back to headquarters. Shh! Not here, Nymphadora. Don't call me Nymphadora. Stay in formation, everyone. Don't break ranks if one of us is killed. So don't call her Nymphadora, but we do call her Natalia Tenner, and she's a fantastic actress, and she was she wishes she could be here. Actually, her birthday, so she wasn't able to fit everything in this weekend. Um, but but she's a big fan of Cinemagic, and she agreed to come on Girls on Film remotely. So please bring on a lovely video that she sent us to enjoy. Well, Natalia, welcome to Girls on Film at Cinemagic. It's lovely to have you with us virtually. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, well, first of all, I wanted to start off talking a little bit about Cinemagic, because as you know, it's a young people's film festival. Mm-hmm. Um, why are you keen to support initiatives like Cinemagic? The, you know, the idea of, of trying to get people, young people involved in, you know, in the arts, I think is an incredible thing. I once, um, I once did a thing trying to help uh, young kids do theatre that had been excluded from school. Um, and some of them were excluded as young as 11, you know, and, and it was really, really sad because it's going to make it much harder for them to kind of go on to higher education. And we did this kind of, you know, th- this this theatre group, and it was amazing how it can inspire kids to to take maybe more positive roots in their life as they get older. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's certainly important to us that young women in particular, obviously from Girls on Film's perspective, yes. are inspired to get involved both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Mm-hmm. And of course, um, there's a Harry Potter anniversary coming up. So we wanted to talk yes. to you about that briefly. Um, what are your kind of most cherished memories of being involved with Harry Potter? <sighs> I mean, it was pretty magical from the beginning um look, it, it's such a complex beast and usually when you do like a, a a costume fitting you only you go once and that's it and with harry potter i went three times three four times they, you know because they're trying to get every element right and i remember that you know the kind of magic of building this character and i was just getting more and more excited especially seeing the studio which i just got lost in every single day for like the first three months i found like where where the catering was and that was about it <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's the most important and thing. And I remember, yeah, 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 the food was great. And um, and I got to pick my wand. I think that was one of my first magical moments. They kind of, you know, once they got my costume sorted, they kind of brought out these, these three wands and they were like, pick one. And I thought that was very, very exciting. The other one was getting on a broomstick. Oh, yeah, on my first day in, they did a plaster cast of my arse and my face. And I was like, what is this for? And it's, it's um, the cast was for the broom. Uh, so it was more comfortable because I think the people that had been in one, two and three, uh, you know, the kids had discovered it was very, very painful, uh, you know, uh, as the, the prototype was at the time. So by the time I got there, I got a very comfy seat and it was very high up and it was on this weird kind of hydraulics and it moved and it was and I had all these like, handsome men like blowing air at me and I had to pretend this this ball was Harry Potter and... Um, I just thought it was amazing. I was like, this is a great day at work. <laughs> Sounds like a great day and a very unusual day. I can't imagine you could say that about yeah, any yeah. other film. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I feel that there's lots about Harry Potter, which is hopefully inspiring to young women in particular. Do you yeah. think there's a feminist element to the series? I mean, I definitely think there is. That you know, There's lots of strong witches, um, you know, uh, to represent uh, women in the books. Hermione is basically the one that's sorting out everything. Like, I mean... They'd both be dead without Hermione. That is, you know, and I think that's a, she's a little pioneer, I think. That's a good charity. I think you're right, actually, thinking about it. Like, yeah, she's probably yeah. all up, isn't she? I'm presuming you consider yourself a feminist? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And how does that inform your work and the kind of choices that you make? It, to be honest, it was hard when I was younger because I had to kind of, you know, maybe there's certain jobs or certain choices or things that when I was younger I would have fought more against um, because I was starting out and I, I didn't really know the lay of the land, obviously it was very pre-me too, <laughs> very pre-me too. Um, I can definitely see the changes now in, in so much already. Um, but I think the way it informs it now is t- sometimes I get scripts and I'm like, this is just gratuitous nakedness. You know, this is like, wh- why <laughs> why is this happening? <laughs> um, or at least have it balanced, you know, let's have some, you know, men naked as well. Some of the stories as well, like when I first started out, I felt like the scripts were much, they just felt more two-dimensional. It was kind of like wife, 
mother, girlfriend, whore, you know, and I think now we're seeing so many things that are changing uh, <laughs> like across the board, all the stuff. I was just watching Made. I mean, that is an incredible series. And, and there's more and more, you know, we're seeing just different kind of facets of, of women. And I think that's amazing. Well, that's what we're fighting for here. And um, yeah. yeah, I'm thrilled to hear from people like yourself when you feel that it is changing, because I feel that it is too. A lot more work to be done, mm. but it's changing. Yeah. And I know you do charity work and activism. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a charity called Orchid Project. Uh, they are amazing. And I discovered them when I was uh, doing some crowdfunding for my album, uh, my band Molotov Jukebox. And you can, when you crowdfund, you can, you know, you can, you can give some profits of your crowdfunding money. And I was like, this is amazing. And I just read a book by Ayan Hirsi Ali. She's phenomenal. Like her journey is just like, what? And she talks about um, female genital, cut, it's now called cutting, not mutilation. And she, I knew it was happening in the world, but it's when I read her story, I was like, oh, wow. I kind of understood like the kind of brutal not just physical, but emotional, what the impact it can have emotionally, physically and sexually in your life, not to mention giving birth and just everything. And I got in, co in contact with Orchid actually when they were a very young company and now they're doing so, so well. And I walked the, in fact, I got back exactly this week, this time last year from walking the Camino. So I did the whole of, um, of the north uh, of, of, uh, of Spain. And I did, I think I walked like 900K. I, I don't know, it was, but it's a long way. And we, me and my best friend managed to raise, I think, nearly six grand. Um, wow, so that amazing. was great. That made me really, really happy. And in fact, today, there's another charity I, I kind of uh, uh, donate to and kind of I, I want to actually start working with, especially now that I've just been watching Made. I'm like, God, I've got to give them some, some kind of um, a shout out uh, called Women's Aid UK. And they're mm -hmm. kind of they're there to help women and refugees and just domestic violence and children as well. Very topical and important subjects there. Mm -hmm. What are you up to next work-wise? At the moment, I have nothing on, on the horizon. I've just finished a, a kind of six months of work. Uh, I did um, a, a, a Sky thing called Wolf, which you can see, it's out now on Sky. That was great. I did four months of that and I did a film called Up on the Roof. And then I did another film, but I don't think I can talk about it. <laughs> I am one of those top secret till, ones. Yeah, it's one of those top secret ones, which I did in the summer. So yeah, at the moment I'm kind of chilling and enjoying, uh, you know, life. Excellent. Well, maybe you can come back on Girls on Film and tell us about your secret project and other things yes. in yes. future. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and maybe in, in person sometime. Um, but finally, I wanted to ask you any message for the Cinemagic audience. Wow. Um, well, to all those, um, is it, you know, it's kind of would be actors and directors and writers you know that are going into the world I would say have a plan b <laughs> I don't know something that's helped me a lot with being self-employed is I also do music and you know I do conventions and I have other means and other things that kind of keep me happy and alive you know baking I love baking you know whatever it is something that you that you have another creative output and maybe a financial one as well because it's it's a tricky um it's a tricky world to navigate and you know you, you know you have to survive so get have a good plan b wise words thank you so much natalia we've really enjoyed having you on girls on film and do come back and see us again thank you i hope so Bye. thank you how great is she i loved her she was amazing yeah she's so fab it was wonderful to speak to her and um she's got so much spirit and you can see what what she brings to tonks even though as you say tonks is a small role yeah. but she's she's pretty feisty right she really is she's so much fun and i think actually she does inject a lot of fun and it, and she has such a great look as well um and uh, yeah i really i really love that advice she it's i think she that is perfect casting because she's someone who is kind of very on the money she's she understands younger people um i think that's a really yeah i think she was great i loved that interview i love her houseboat of course she lives on a houseboat <laughs> yeah, of course she does she's just so cool she's amazing yeah but real free spirit i think yeah. and that's what she brings to it Absolutely. i'd love to hear a bit from the audience because i know there's a lot of harry potter fans here um if, if you want to raise your hand and let us know if you've got anything you wanted to say yeah at the front i was actually really interested in hearing how you both were talking about race represented in the films I adore Harry Potter, I adore the films. Coming from a mixed race background myself, what I maybe picked up on more, as more did my cousins and my family, was whenever there was anybody of a different race in the films, they were portrayed very to date. The, the, the Patel sisters, Cho Chang, um, they, were, they never are really given a role that separates them from their racial identity, I find. And most famous case, Lavender Brown in the second 
film, she was a, a black actress. When she became a love interest, she was then portrayed as like a white actress. And we picked up on that more so than anybody else, you know, and say my mum's side of the family then. Um, I was just kind of wondering with talks of, you know, a TV series possibly being made out. Um, you know, we had fantastic Noma presenting Hermione and the cursed, the cursed child for the stage play. Um, do you feel that the way that things are now in Hollywood, that more push should be focused on and getting, you know, more complexity added to these characters of different race? I know you mentioned Dean Thomas, where all of a sudden realism was, you know, attached to his character, yeah. you know, the, uh, the idea of a single or a, a, a black child that was then only had like a single mother, the idea that that realism is, can be afforded there, but somehow can't be afforded elsewhere. Um, do you feel in the film set and in the film world at the moment that should there be like a TV show that is made that that push can be made and can be applied that way, which I hope it does definitely. Great point, great question. Rihanna, do you want to go first? Yes, I really, I, that's a really great kind of question and summary as well, because if there is a TV series, we will have a lot more time, I think, with these characters. We'd have to, right? Otherwise, what would be the point? Um, so hopefully we would have time to explore the complexities and the backgrounds. And um, and again, I think that's where J.K. Rowling does fall down quite a lot because we don't get enough of that with a lot of the characters who aren't white. Um, so I would love to see a little bit more of that, a lot more of that, but also definitely with the casting. I think now, bearing in mind, you know, what, 20 years ago, kind of all, you know, white directors, white writers, white character, white actors. Um, I really think that we have kind of made leaps and strides in that direction. And I think we ha we are enough of a vocal fan base as well now, especially with, with Harry Potter, that hopefully we as fans can implement change as well. Hopefully we can say what we want, what we would love to see on screen, how important that is. I think hopefully now we might be listened to, and maybe that's a bit naive to think that, but I really... Uh, you know, I think it is so important. And you're right with Hermione and the cursed child. There, there was a little, there was a little bit, there was an uproar. I think actually, a incredibly racist uproar about it. And yet, look how wonderfully she portrayed this character. Um, and I know that J.K. Rowling said, oh, I never said that Hermione was white. I just said that she was bushy-haired. And we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You meant her to be white. Like, don't try and kind of go back on it. But it's fine that, you know, I'm glad that she was behind the casting of a black actress. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think having colorblind casting would be wonderful for something like Harry Potter, where we all envision ourselves as the characters. You know, we... You know, I think of myself as Harry or whoever. You know, it doesn't... We don't need them to be exact because our imaginations always fill in the gaps. Well said, yeah, and thank you for that. It really taps into a lot of the discussions we have on Girls on Film in general about representation, about race, and, you know, the old saying, if she can see it, she can be it, and how important it is to have that on screen and to see yourself represented on screen. So, yeah, yeah, totally agree with you, Rana. Another question, please? Hi. I uh, just uh, wanted to say a thing about, you were saying about Bellatrix Lestrange there. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, another thing that she does is before Bellatrix Lestrange appeared, uh, it, the villains were mainly male, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. You know, whereas she was the first female villain, yeah. if you know what I mean. You know, I think that was really important, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, the, another female that uh, really took me by surprise was actually Luna Lovegood mm -hmm. because before you know um, in, in her first few films that she did she it was she was always like very what, what was it she, she, she always be in a world of her own let's say and uh, and then in the last film she uh she was following Harry at one stage and Harry was ignoring her and he and then she said to me Harry, you stop here and listen to me right now. And that actually took me by surprise. I was like, whoa, Luna Lovegood. <laughs> Where did that come from? I know. So, yeah. the, uh, so I think that there are two ladies that, uh, in Harry Potter that really, you know, uh, surprised me if you know what I mean you know so totally agree you, absolutely you, you, and, then, yeah. and you're right with you know with her being a the sort of female general as well with Voldemort the only death I think that Voldemort is genuinely upset by and genuinely shocked by and you think that although he is so happy being alone I think he genuinely had a connection with Bellatrix a terrifyingly awful one but a connection nevertheless um so yeah you're right that's really interesting Thank you. Anyone else, anything to add to our conversation here? Yeah. So you talked a lot about the sort of good female characters and the bad female characters. And I was just thinking, well, like, I feel as if the bad female characters, so we have like Bellatrix Strange, we have um, all the others we talked about. And I feel like the 
um, quote unquote good female characters have a lack of agency without their male counterparts. They sort of, we never get to see them be just a woman, just a teenage witch. And then you have these bad female characters who they, they're they actually removed from Voldemort and from their male counterparts and they're, they're these their own people like Rita Skeeter and everything. And it's sort of like um, if you're giving that active agency to bad characters, what sort of message is that portraying to its younger audience? That's such a great point. It's so true, a kind of lack of agency with a lot of the female characters. Um, I was thinking about Fleur because Fleur Delacour is supposed to be on a level with Victor Crumb and um, and Cedric and Harry as a great fighter and she's representing her school. Um, and yet we see her kind of almost more as a victim more often than not in the Triwizard tournaments. And, you know, she just doesn't advance. No one is really worried about her as a competitor because she's just not as good as the rest of them. And that's that's really frustrating to me, um, especially when Harry has to kind of save her save her um, little sister, etc. And also when, when you look at a lot of the female characters, often, you know, they're crying. Look at Cho. What's the kind of word that you think of with Cho? Wet. How was the kiss with Cho? It was wet. She was crying. You know, all of this kind of stuff. And um, and so she's always, she's always kind of a bit dismissed, disregarded. She doesn't really get the time or the space to as you say, just be a complex young female character. She's upset about Cedric and then she's jealous about Harry and that's all that she does, basically. Um, so, yeah, I agree with that a lot. And again, I think you watching the films over and over again and listening, uh, re- re- listening. you can tell that I listen to the audiobooks a lot, <laughs> listening to the audiobooks, reading the books all the time, you do start to become more and more critical and you realise those gaps a lot more, I think, than the first few times. Um, and I think as, a, as, as I've got older and as the world has been changing, you do become so much more aware of these huge gaps. Uh, do you remember in the film where there's that bit about love, the love potion and you just see all the girls surrounding it kind of looking on in awe at this cauldron of love potion? Um, because, of course, that's the only thing that young girls are interested in is tricking boys into falling in love with them. Uh, just that really annoyed, <laughs> annoyed me. Um, so, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's great. Another great point. I love this audience. It's so great to hear from you all about, you know, the analysis that you're undertaking, the sort of thing that we love to talk about. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on from Harry Potter just really briefly. Oh, I've asked for um, Rihanna and myself for some picks of other sort of classic magic movies. So, Rihanna, your first pick was Mary Poppins. <laughs> Why did you choose this? Well, I just, you know, she's never described really as a witch, except maybe very briefly by Michael, I think, at one point. Um, but... She is the most kind of magical being that so many of us grew up with. And she's, uh, she, uses, <laughs> she uses her magic in, again, some quite domesticated ways, like to clean up the nursery. Um, but also, you know, to, to create fun and all of these worlds for the children that she looks after. And I, that was such a lovely trait. And it was so amazing as a child to be able to go into these worlds with her. The kind of whole idea of jumping into a chalk painting on the floor was so magical and just so wonderful and I don't know as a a little girl this really really appealed to me this film you see in every job that must be done there is an element of fun you find the fun and snap the job's a game and every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake a lark a spree it's very clear to see that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, the medicine go down, medicine go down. We have the later <laughs> Mary Poppins as well. Um, perhaps slightly different, but actually I didn't I didn't hate the new Mary Poppins. I liked Poppins. it. Yeah. I thought it was very sweet. I think um, Emily Blunt is, is a gorgeous actress. There are there are some really nice kind of magical realism scenes, but there is a the, it, perhaps with CGI and all of the things that we're able to do now, it makes us a little bit more cynical about those magical worlds. I think when you literally just have a, a kind of chalk, which then becomes two D animation for a child, that's kind of all you need. That was way that was more than enough. And a talking umbrella, it was so sim. It's so much more simple, I think, in 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 those in those earlier films, that's and true. yet just takes you so. Much much further 
By contrast, I've chosen to flag up a 2016 film called The Love Witch, which is a much more adult <laughs> affair, so they won't go into it too much. Um, but it's, uh, it's, have you seen this one? Yes. It's such a kind of splashy horror, um, you know, very culty, very highly styled. Um, you don't really know which way it's going. It's got a real vintage feel. But I definitely say if you, if you're, you know, if you like something a little bit edgy and different and very darkly funny. Very dark. And also beautiful to look at. She has some amazing costumes in this and again doesn't really conform to a witchy look exactly and so this is directed by Anna Billa so this is a female directed story and um, yeah I think that's absolutely key after Jerry died the cops wouldn't stop harassing me they couldn't prove anything they actually thought that I killed him anyways San Francisco got to be a really bad trip after you left and that's when I remembered you had that extra apartment Hey, I'm Trish. Hi, Trish. Well, what do men want? Just a pretty woman to love and to take care of them. Love me. Love me. What I'm really interested in is love. You might say I'm addicted to love. Uh, Rihanna, you also picked out The Witches from 1990, so the, the first adaptation of this book. Yes, just because I rewatched this the other day, and it's such an amazing, such an amazing film. It's such a great adaptation of Roald Dahl's book, and again, so frightening. And I think that's something that we maybe forget with um, some of the, some kind of kids' horrors, is that actually children sometimes really like to be scared. And I think Angelica Houston did it better than anybody, and she's so terrifying when she's peeling off that, but that mask and all that her kind of hump comes out and all these warts appear and she is much more of a traditional witch who hates children and there is so much fun to be had with that kind of character it is a splendid film and of course they did a remake last year the witches or rather a new version directed by robert zemeckis um and anne hathaway in the lead role um not so well reviewed critically i still enjoyed it i mean it's difficult when you know how great the original is um but i still liked it i thought anne hathaway was fabulous Witches. They're real. And they hate children. Welcome. What would you do if there were mice running all around the hotel? I would call the exterminator. You see, girls? He would exterminate those brats. Uh, rats. We would exterminate the rats. Now, Rihanna, I'd like to talk to you about some new releases that are coming out because it's a pretty exciting time for film. Cinemas are open. Yeah. I haven't seen this yet, but I'm super excited about it. Eternals. Tell me. Yes, The Eternals, but directed by Chloe Zhao, um, which is one of the things that I was most excited about because obviously Nomadland did pretty well at the awards. Just a bit, <laughs> cleaned up. Um, so this was really kind of a big deal, I think. Um, and seeing something like this on the big screen with so many superheroes in, I think has drawn quite a lot of... I think critics have been quite a little bit... Um, unkind to this film to be honest mm -hmm. um i don't think it i think it is still really entertaining it is long very long um but you but i think what the film does so well is try to represent as many different people as it possibly can mm -hmm. um pos i don't know maybe too many but i'm not complaining because you know we we have our very first deaf superhero um played by lauren ridloff which i think is really huge um we've got um someone like Kamal Nanjiani, who um, we've really kind of only seen in comedy roles before. And he, again, he is playing quite a comedic role, but still a superhero. Um, so we kind of have a bit of Bollywood in his background, which is quite nice. Um, we So I think she's she's done quite an incredible job. It's all very grounded in nature as well, which feels very true to Chloe Zhao's persona um, and what I found amazing about this was that there are so many different locations as you can imagine with 10 different people and their backstories and also because it's set across since like the beginning of time since before humanity almost um, and so they have to go to so many different places and they use the UK to double as all of these places which I had no idea about so when you when you're in like kind of 
South Dakota or um, Chicago were actually in like Surrey and Wiltshire and and just... Central London around our way they were filming. Yes. So, yeah, I yeah. remember thinking, how is that going to work? But I can't wait to see the finished product with all the visual effects that make it look yes, like those places. Very cool. And it sounds like it's really good from a representation point of view. Big fan of Closure, so thank yes. you. I'm excited about that. It's beautiful, isn't it? Another one that I'm very pleased to have seen is Passing, which is in select cinemas now, and it's on Netflix on the 10th of November. And this is the directorial debut of Rebecca Hall, one of my favourite actresses. Absolutely fantastic. And I really like this film. Would you want to set it up? Because you've seen it as well, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, this, so this is a story about um, two women who are both African-American, but one is able very much to pass as white. And in fact, passes so well that she's married to a white man. Not only... A white man but a very racist white man and so kind of is always living in fear that she's going to be found out and when she sees this old school friend who's played by Tessa Thompson she kind of realizes what she's been missing by not having her African-American community around her which Tessa Thompson's character very much does have including a black husband and um, black children so they live in a different kind of fear and I think it is quite interesting and quite telling that these two women are both living in fear it's a fascinating setup on not one that I was very much aware of because it's said in the late late 1920s mm -hmm. and apparently this really was a thing, the passing of the title, you know, passing for a white person. So really interesting film, amazing female talent behind Ruth that Neger one. Ruth Negger is excellent. Ruth Negger, well. Tess Thompson, both fantastic. Mm -hmm. Ruth Negger, as you've never seen her before, very different role, but I yes. think she's fantastic. Considering as well that she's she's Irish. Yes, she's and an then Irish when you see an interview where they forget that she's not American yeah. because she's so good in yeah, this. You're like, oh my is. gosh, I forgot you were Irish. And she started in Misfits of all things. She did, didn't she? Channel 4's Misfits. I love Misfits. Yeah. yeah. So, Ruth, go, Ruth. Amazing. Pardon me, I don't mean to stare, but I think I know you. Claire? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find out the history of the blonde you've brought along. She's a girl from Chicago I used to know. Princess from Chicago. Things aren't always what they seem. I'll be damned. Lots of people pass all the time. It's easy for a Negro to pass for white. I'm not sure it'd be so simple for a white person to pass for color. So you haven't ever thought to? What? Have you ever thought of passing? No, why should I? Now I have everything I've ever wanted. Finally, The Colour Room. This is one that's been mentioned on Girls on Film before because Kerry Fox is in it and she mentioned it yes. when she came onto our show in Latitude. The Colour Room is about Clarice Cliff, who is an amazing kind of ceramics artist um, and hasn't really been shown on film before. And uh, tell me what you thought of this one. I really love this, actually. It stars Phoebe Dinover, who we all know from Bridgerton. Um, and she plays Clarice in this really kind of uplifting, exciting, inspiring kind of way. Uh, we've kind of maybe seen this story. it's quite um made in Dagenham-esque maybe that whole idea of factory girl um kind of protesting a little bit about the conditions that she's you know why am I only allowed to be in this room why can't I be in that room um and make sure that she is able to get into that room um a seat at the table etc and also catches the eye of the kind of factory owner who's played by Matthew Good. I say we stop playing it safe thicker strokes and colour be careful that's clear don't misinterpret my brother's attentions. If we sell directly to women, we'd be leading the way in the potteries. A modern woman will not want tat. The modern woman is forward-looking, not backward-looking. And it looks beautiful, this film, actually, we should say. And also the female roles are like that Kerry Fox does play. She plays a harried mother, but she's so supportive of her children, which I think we don't necessarily always see. Um, so I think the way that they've kind of portrayed their relationship was so strong, so interesting. And it's a, you know, it's not a groundbreaking film, but it's a really gorgeous one to sit back and watch. And it's a true story. 
Absolutely, and it's directed by a woman, written by a woman. It's in cinemas and on Sky Cinema from 12th of November. So that's The Colour Room. Rihanna, thank you so, so much thank for joining you. us. You've thank been you absolutely amazing. Thank you talking about Harry Potter for an hour. I really appreciate it. And Natalia Tenner for joining us remotely. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you to Cinemagic Belfast for having us. We've absolutely loved it. Um, for the wonderful Hedda Archbold for producing and to assistant producer Heather Dempsey and Eliana J. To Ben Cook for the video editing we saw there, which was fabulous. To our new interns, Rosa Herxheimer and Shania Pithia. Our principal partners, Vanessa Smith and Peter Brewer. And do support Girls on Film if you can. It's a passion project three years going but we really need to keep growing and spreading the word because I think there's a lot of important things that we discuss and we have fun <laughs> like we've had today thank you so much thank you you're going to take someone's eye out besides you're saying it wrong it's Leviosa not Leviosa